done. It's oh, coming. It Got it. There it is. Got it. Good morning, all you figure eight lovers, tennis nuts out there. This is Jack Brody, and I'm uh, I'm living at the 45 today with my longtime friend Matt Palomari. And Matt is uh, boy, he is a special person. Uh, he he's an author by trait, but he he's he's more than that. He frequently visits the mountain mountains, deserts, and jungles of North, South, and Central America, studying shamanism. He's, he's on his quest. He has 18 books in print in multiple genres. Uh, his book, The Infinity Zone, is where we first met. He does an in-depth analysis of the figure eight dynamics. And this book took first place in the International Book Awards and has the winner of a San Diego Book Award. His latest book, Holog Graphic Cosmic Man, there's a mouthful, is an expanded version of the Infinity Zone. So I am so delighted today to be talking to my friend, uh, Matt. It's, it's so great to see you. We, we've lost a little bit of touch, but and, well, except for on social media, but that's not going to happen again, is it? No, we're, we're connected at the hip, bro. Good deal. Good deal. Well, say hi to everybody out there because we'll get started because uh, most of the people that follow me know... I'm into this uh, different kind of thinking, you know, thinking more along the laws of nature, like uh, the figure eight, the 45 degree angle, counterbalance, as opposed to just regular old balance. And uh, Matt, maybe tell them a little bit more than I did about your background, especially when it, it's regards to the uh, figure eight. So uh, I, I've been studying shamanism all of my life, really, and it underlies all of my writing. And I spent uh, a lot of time in the Peruvian Amazon working with plant medicines. And um, I always like to say that everything I ever learned about sacred geometry, I learned from my ayahuasca plant experiences. And I, I connected with a very good friend of mine, uh, Professor Scott Olson. He's a professor of comparative religion. And he's a big sacred geometry person. So I got the whole initial download for uh, the infinity zone when I was in the jungle doing those extended plant diets. And I actually wrote a paper called um, uh, Theory of the Evolution of Consciousness, which was the basis for the infinity zone. So then when I started getting into the figure eight and studying um, how powerful it is, then um, I started, it's like anything, you buy a new car, you know, I bought a new Prius years ago, and then all of a sudden I saw Prius is everywhere, right? Right. So I got deep into the figure eight and realized how effective it was. And the, the first book was called The Infinity Zone, because right in the middle of the figure eight is really where the power is. And when you follow, you know, the whole pattern of it, you see it, it, it's everywhere, uh, especially uh, in tennis, but, you know, baseball pitchers, fly fishermen, martial arts, it's, it's everywhere. And it's the most effective, most powerful uh, form of, of uh, movement, perfect form in motion. I like to think of it that way. Yeah, you know, I, I use it as well. You know, my, my whole system, tennis system, sports system is based on understanding the underlying principles of all great athletes, all natural athletes. And, and the figure eight certainly is at the core uh, of all of that movement. Before we break into more um, specifics, uh, the origin came to you while you were actually in the jungle and not doing math? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, through the visions that I had, I always like to say I learned everything that way. Then I went and read all the books afterward. And uh, my friend, uh, Professor Olson, that I just mentioned, he gave me a whole list of books. And of course, I went out and bought all of them and read them all cover to cover and mm -hmm. became um, quite authoritative on it. And, and once you start to see it, like I mentioned, you, you, you see it everywhere. Oh, yeah. I say the same thing uh, with regards to that, like the 45 degree angle. Once you realize, oh, microscope, I mean, everything you turn to, a re release of a baseball when a pitcher throws a ball is at the 45, the way a, an archer or a rifleman, you know, anyone, a sharpshooter lines up is at the 45 degree angle. The golf balls put at the 45 degree angle when you're driving. So I, I hear you. Uh, it all happened to me. What, 
about the same time. I mean, we're, I'm talking for me about 25 years ago. And for you, I, shortly after that, I kind of remember that. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe 15 years ago for me. Uh, uh -huh. maybe, uh, maybe closer to 20. Um, yeah, you came into the scene quite, quite early uh, when you guys were writing that book. And uh, I was even a little part of it. I think I got a couple of chapters in there, didn't I? You're in there. You're a rock star, dude. You're, 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 you're definitely, <laughs> definitely part of it. Yeah, I, I do remember submitting a couple of uh, a couple of words. Um, you know, it, it's funny. That's uh, for me the whole thing uh, when I started looking into it, and I probably read a lot of the books you read. Uh, you know uh, about uh, mazes and and all, all you know lemnus gates and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized it went all the way back to string theory. I mean, oh. if you look at that string theory, it's uh, it's absolutely a continuous figure eight. It it actually even goes back to to prehistoric, like ancient Egypt. Um, but without getting off track too much, I'm interested. <laughs> well, my new book, Holographic Cosmic Man, I made up that word, and it's based on the Temple of Anthropocosmic Man, which is in Luxor, Egypt. And it's a very precise mathematical map of the human body. And it's full of, uh, the basis of all of it comes from the golden mean and the golden cut. Uh, one sure, the golden mean, absolutely, the golden mean, you bet. Yeah, 1.618. And for me, particularly with the figure eight and uh, the work that you're doing with it, to me, it branches, it broaches, and branches and broaches both physics and geometry. Uh, it's one of the things that really ties it hand in hand. And much of the work I do in this field is based on the work of Rudolf Steiner. Um, Steiner was a person, he was he was sort of always tried to connect the spiritual with the psychological, uh, as did Carl Jung. That was Carl Jung's big contribution is, you know, connecting the two. Hmm. And in, a, in, in that temple of man, Every arch, every piece of artwork, everything within it is very precise. And they say that it's a map of the cosmos and the human body, and that the human body is actually a microcosm of the macrocosm, the, the bigger picture. So that fascinated me. And when I found out about it, I just got totally sucked into it. And then the, the big book, Temple of Man, there are actually two huge volumes was a Frenchman by the name of Schwaller de Lubitz. And he spent 15 years doing a complete analysis of that temple and all of the geometry that it contains. And then, like I mentioned a little bit ago, once you see it in one place, you see it everywhere. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, go ahead. You know, we talk a lot about uh, contrary motion and and counterbalance uh and i tried to explain to people i was wondering if i have something here uh, i'll dig into a tennis bag see if i get lucky enough to find a a tennis ball uh -huh. but just you know not to get too jockey on you uh, oh, that's okay I'm a, I'm, because, a, I'm a jock at heart okay uh, because, oh, I found good because there's a couple of ways to look at it, you know, and, and, and sports that is. Uh -huh. And, you know, most people see sports as a linear thing. They use linear words, load, meaning put all your weight down on something without really any regards to uh, the laws of nature, science, you know, where you have to have, you know, equal and opposite movements, right? Uh -huh. I mean, when uh -huh. you have weight in your back leg here and you're down, then something has to be up. And representing the left side of your body for counterbalance, mm -hmm. and and I like to show people this drill with this tennis ball because and see how you relate to this in your studies. You know, most people think that you throw a ball like this and you throw it from hand to hand, and as you do, your whole body, the whole side of your body switches and goes towards that target. But what we talk about, at least in Brody Tennis System, is we talk about opposites, meaning when my hips go one way, my hands go the other. Mm -hmm. So a different way of throwing it, right? You, you can do this, right? 
And I would call, I would call this very off balance and, and not easy, not effortless. Or you can do the opposite, which is always have counterbalance. And that's what some of the beautiful players do, like a, a Roger Federer. He was my favorite, really, because you always saw this easy balance he had. And you didn't see this dramatic, you know, over effort, overwork. And I always thought he lived um, into the principles that at least I talk about. And I would love to hear your take on that. Sure. Yeah. Let me, I'll, um, I'm going to back out a little bit with it and bring it on in, so to speak. Sounds great. So, so, you know, I studied martial arts for a number of years. A martial arts punch, you have a stance, a horse stance, you're grounded. And then you, you start by turning your hips. And then you extend, as you're turning your hips, it extends into your arm. And then you, then you twist your arm into the punch. So you're actually coming from the ground using your whole body. And then your arm is literally like cracking a whip. So all of the power from the ground up through your whole body and everything comes out into your two knuckles. And that's where the energy is focused and that's where the power is. So if you study sports, uh, tennis more than anything, but, but it, it equally is across the board, you'll find that the greatest players always are using the figure eight, whether they're conscious of it or not. So if, if you watch a, a baseball pitcher, the, the wind up and the pitch, it's just a variation on the martial arts punch and you wanna get the maximum effectiveness and power and control by using that. The other example I always love to give is if, if you take a, a pendulum and you swing it, people think that on one extreme is power, but that's not the case. When you get to the end of that swing, the furthest out, you have a moment when it switches direction where it's actually momentarily weightless because there's no power there. And then when you come down, Right in the middle is where the maximum power is until you go back up the other way. And the further you go up the other direction, it diminishes until you get to that point of no more power and comes back the other way. So it's that swing back and forth. That's where the power is. And when you're, when you're, we do it unconsciously, but when we're aware of it and we're conscious of it, like in your tennis system, it brings the maximum effectiveness. And when you realize not only is your body doing the figure eight for maximum power, or, you know, or Roger Federer, like you mentioned, you're also with your opponent at the other end of the court, volleying to them and then volleying back is also a figure eight. So well, sure, because the ball rises and falls, absolutely. right? It rises and falls. So you, you it, and that's how, you know, we say you time your motions in your in your hips is you time it with the movement of the ball exactly and you're also subconsciously or consciously aware of all your opponent's moves because you know if you can you want to spike them and you want to get ahead of the game if you can want to hit a winner you want to hit a winner right right so you want to hit a winner you want to do that back and forth and then you think about the the figure eight in the body and the figure eight of being on the court with your opponent. It's that that's a whole nother sort of microcosm within the macrocosm. And that's one of the reasons why I titled the book The Infinity Zone, because it's 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 infinite movement and it's everywhere. It's it, you know the oh. when you when animals run, you watch the gate of like a cheetah running, right? When horses gallop, when dogs run, it's it's a figure eight. Uh, there are all the examples in sports and in, in, in the animal kingdom. Well, I mean, sports, and as you say, in the spiritual world too, I mean, talking about Rudolf Steiner, I mean, didn't he always say night goes into day, day goes into night? It's all very nonlinear. You can't define, oh, it's night. It's dark now. It just, it goes gradually as, as does infinity. It's right. And it's all about power. And one of the definitions of shamanism is the power path. And to seek true power, you want to go for the middle. There's a, there's a great American Indian saying, uh, it applies to, to politics too and all that. There's the right wing and the left wing, but um, they both belong to the same bird. And um, I always like to say, if you go far enough right, you're going to end up left. And if you go far enough left, you're going to end up right. Um, I get so, it. I get it. Because it's the infinite. 
Yeah, yeah. So, and and the power of the infinite is right in the middle of that figure eight, which is what I is what I call the infinity zone. I also call it, uh, among other things, effortless mastery. And um, aside from being um, a martial artist, I'm a drummer. I've been a drummer all of my life. Um, oh, I wish you were out here in Denver. I need a drummer real bad oh, right man. now. I got I, one of the last things I kept. I still got my whole drum set in the closet, and I still play hand drums. But um, th the whole thing about drumming, to do the best uh, stroke of a drumstick, is that whole figure eight snap. And each each time, you're doing figure eights back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's where the power is. And when you get that snap at the end of it, that's where you get the most effective control in, in the stroke of a drumstick. Uh, or yeah. with your hand. Yeah, well, I mean, so much music, right? I mean, a guitar string moves in a figure eight. Uh, yeah. you, you know, uh, it's, uh, and even when a violin uh, is being played right properly, yeah. they don't go up and back. They, they nope. have, yeah, there's a rounding of the corner, so to speak. That's right. And that's, that's where the effectiveness is. And that's where the balance is. And also, uh, in, in shamanism, when you're going for the center, if you think about a hurricane, what happens in the eye of the storm? Nothing. Quiet. Yeah. So uh, when you're working on yourself and doing your inner work, you're looking for that center because when you're at the center, you have the greatest view of everything. You're not at one extreme or the other. You're not out there at the winds where they're crazy or the outer part of it where they're going a million miles an hour. You're really going for the center. And once you're in the center, you can see the whole thing. Um, I had another little revelation when I was thinking about doing this show with you here. If you take 45 and you break it, it takes it takes eight 45s to make a 360. And a 360 is full circle. So, in, in, you know, in esoteric terms and shamanism, that's a, the circles everywhere, particularly, you know, in American Indian and South American uh, cultures, indigenous cultures, it, it circles a big deal. And then you think about the figure eight and what is it? It's two circles connect together, right? The golden mean, you just, that's it. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's just uh, basically, basically uh, you take uh, some kind of a rubber band and you just twist it and there's yeah. your figure eight. So, uh, but, but in both cases, it's infinite, right? Where does the eight, where does the eight stop? And the same with the circle. When does it stop? It never does. That's right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Well, we have a slightly different take, you know, uh, even though the power is in your center. And I, I'd love to hear your take on this because this and this just occurred to me now, uh -huh. because for starters, we don't I don't say the ground up. OK, not to disagree. It feels to me like the ground up when you're playing good tennis. But that's because it's more of a double conic, meaning the core of your body, your center of gravity is your dantian, right? Your, your yes. hips. Yes. So when your hips move, it tugs at your feet. And I believe it makes your it feel it feels like your feet's doing the work, but that's only because it's being tugged by the hips. So it's sort of a double conic. It, the hips move up into the arm and it also moves down into the legs. Yeah. And so that's the way we think of it here. And then the other thing is it's not so much we crack the whip on every ball, but we 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 create a a sine wave, a standing wave. Do you know yes. a standing? Okay. Absolutely. So we create a standing wave, meaning if I'm holding those two uh, ropes, heavy ropes, they move in a wave and a continuous uh -huh. wave. And we make contact according, you know, to our system at the 45 degree angle, but as it goes from concave to convex. So uh -huh. right as the racket goes and your arm, right? Everything is in a nonlinear coil. And as it as your hips pull it out and it it goes the other way, that's where you get the biggest bump into the ball. And that's how we I use the system here. And I wanted to explain that to you a little bit better and see what you thought of that, because that is in a nutshell, the system. Yeah. So, you know, I mentioned the martial arts coming from the ground up. And, and that also has to do with not getting knocked on your butt when somebody else swings at you. But when you're on the court and you're playing tennis, you don't always want to hit it with maximum power. Maybe you just want to hit it so it falls really close to the net because you know your opponent's further out, right? So 
you're using that figure eight, you're controlling the amount of power you put in every stroke, and it's going to vary with each stroke depending on where your opponent is. You know, if he's on one side of the court, you want to send him the other way. Uh, you know, like I say, if he's far out and you want to spike it, you want to whack it, but even then you're modifying the figure eight because you want to have it closer when it spikes, um, or, or maybe in another situation you want to have it further. But it is, it is in there. And one little thing too I want to mention, as an aside, the the Don Tien you just mentioned, yes, that's pretty much right. And if you split the human body, that's the golden cut. It's pretty much your, your belly button is at one point six one eight on the human body. Your body is split by the golden mean at that point. So well, that's that's kind of what I'd always heard because I've done a lot of yoga and some a little yeah, bit of exactly. Tai Chi and. Yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. they talk about, the Dantian, which is just above your belly button, maybe an inch or so. Yeah, yeah. And, and the human body is full of the golden mane everywhere throughout. Um, yeah. So, so you were talking about aiming the ball. And, and you yeah. see this device I've, I created here. Uh, uh -huh. It's hard to see with the virtual thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah. let's see. Let's see if yeah, I move the microphone. Here. Anyway, it has a... Um, See, it's curved. You see how it's curved? Yeah. So what we say is if you hit the ball right in the center at the 45, it'll go straight. But if you just angle your face slightly differently, it'll go cross court or down the line. And yeah. that's and that's so you use your racket as a nonlinear object and not a linear, you know, not a flat object as it is, but as a nonlinear object. And so that's kind of how we aim since you brought up aiming is, yeah. and that's the beauty of the 45, right? Cause at the 45, imagine trying to balance a piece of paper on a perfect 45 degree angle. You wouldn't be able to do it because at that point at the 45, that's the easiest place to massage the ball. And that may have something to do with infinity also, because you know, the 45 degree point is a perfect point and it's kind of infinite. And uh, so, yes, at that point, that's why the great players can disguise their shots, right? Because at that point, they just turn their hand a little bit. So the racket face is on the 45, but just slightly um, shaping the ball instead yeah. of just hitting the back of the ball. Yeah. And just, just a little bit of nuance in the angle. I mean, almost microscopic sometimes of the angle of the racket, right? You can send it up, down, sideways. I mean, and and in the end, and I know you know this, I'm preaching to the choir here, but, you know, good, best players, the racket is really just an extension of their arm. It's it's, it's like having a longer limb. That's that's right. And your limbs are nonlinear, right? I mean, we can bend them. We can use the elbow. I mean, look how pivotal the elbow is and the wrist as well. Yeah. So th they really don't move in a linear way, even though tennis is too often taught in a linear way yeah yeah and not to get off track but one more thing about the uh the golden mean in the human body the first part of your finger and the next part that is the golden mean those two segments to the next segment is the golden mean that segment to the next up to the wrist is the golden mean and it's all throughout the body so when you understand and this has to do with your tennis system when you understand the geometry of the body then you learn how to effectively use it, you know, in a, in, a, in a powerful way, because you're aware of how it all really works and you're, and you're going with the flow, so to speak, as opposed to, you know, trying to force something and being stiff. It's the same thing with, with you know, sports, martial arts, playing drums. Uh, my drumming teacher used to yell at me because I get my shoulders all scrunched up. He'd be relaxed, you know, flow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny, even the players themselves, I think, use different terminology. I know uh, some of my better students and, and when we when we hit and play, we'll use words like, oh, man, we're really roping the ball today. Uh -huh. But other most people are concerned with how hard they hit the ball. They oh, I hit the ball hard or I was erratic or this or that. But you don't even use the same words because, yeah, it is a feeling of your arm and racket being a rope when you really, you know, have the confidence to know what you're doing. And like I said earlier, that contrary motion where the, where the racket is sort of the dog's tail yep. and, and, and it's following the core. Yeah. And yep. Um, so, yeah, I just, it, boy, you got in a mouthful of tennis today. I know that's not your thing, Matt. 
Uh, a lot of my friends are tennis players. Um, I was big on racquetball. And then um, I had too many knee problems. So I have eventually had to stop that. And none of us are getting any younger. Gotcha. Gotcha. How so in your shamanism, and, and as long as we're still on the, the figure of eight, uh -huh. uh, any any is there any health advice that could come off of this? Because, you know, tennis players are always looking to be getting better shape and feel better. Uh, you know, I know on the court, I always tell my players to wait in the figure eight, you know, just just, you know, it used to be the position where you, you constantly move your lower body, kind of like a baseball player. Yeah. Right. A baseball players up here like this. They're connecting their lower, their upper body to their lower body. Right. Where, uh, you know, the lower body is sort of the engine. And then the limbs are kind of like the branches of a tree when you're trying to get an apple, you know, to fall off the tree. Yeah. And when you go from the lower body, uh, thinking about it as the trunk and the hips, there's tons of power in the hips. So then you take that and you channel it out you know, out through the arm and all the way out, even to the fingers. Sometimes you're, it's like, it's literally, it's like the branch of a tree where it extends out to the very end. And if you think about even what happens at the end of a branch of a tree, you have buds, you have more branches coming. It's that whole thing of bringing the power up. And even, you know, I use the example of the martial arts punch and being grounded. But when you, when you're on the court there, you're moving around and all that but you're still coming, a lot of your power is coming from the hips. And then when you get out to your hand is where you can really fine tune, you know, your stroke and, and, and how and where you're hitting it and where it's going to go and all those good things. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And the 45 is sort of your point of optimal contact because it's at that point where the power and the control all merge. Yeah. Fine tuning. I mean, even, even I, years of practice with my drumming teachers, there's the drumstick and there's the rebound and all the things you do with it. But the ultimate fine tuning control is in the fingers on, on how much you let the stick vibrate when you hit. And, and, you know, if you're doing like a, a, a drum roll, uh, particularly on a snare drum, you eat that buzz, you're manipulating your fingers, um, you know, for the fine tuning part of it. So hmm. if you understand the physics of the body, and how physics work overall, you want to go with the flow. You want to, you want to roll, you want to, you don't want to swim upstream, so to speak. You don't want to be too tight, you know, and restricted because as soon as you tighten up, you're already limiting yourself. And there's a real balance there because when you're on the court and you want to win, you can get too tight very easily because, ah, you know, I want to do this, right? But yeah. It's, it's and, and that really is what happens in more in a linear mindset. I, I know I used to be one of those players where I just, you know, my my emotions and my ego almost took over the match, you know, and instead of hitting a beautiful shot that I know I should be hitting, I block the ball or I chip it back just to go, oh, you know, I'll be ugly this one. The next one I'll rip. But in the juniors, you end up being ugly the whole match sometimes. So, yeah, I had always uh, admired and uh, sort of emulated the better players that looked like they were actually having fun out there. And the pressure didn't seem to matter one bit. It just that's the way it was. The best players, you just go, they, they come up with the biggest shots at the biggest moments. That's, uh, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. When you're relaxed like that. That's the key. That's where the yeah. power is. And, and certainly, you know, the figure eight represents, I think, the ultimate in balance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if you're going back and forth like that, you're balancing yourself and you're balancing against your opponent. But you're, you're, if you're fully aware of it and you have your body trained, then you're going to have, you're going to take control the way that, that Federer did. Yeah. Well, you'd be amazed that the figure eight, at least in my thoughts with tennis, it's not just the figure eight in the left and right side. It's the figure eight in the upper and lower body. Yep. It's the figure eight with regards to your infinite core, your infinite center, and out to your infinite periphery, right? At contact. That's right. where you are moving the quickest, right? That's because right. it's like a flag, you know, it starts really small. And then as it gets out to the end of the flag, the flag is, is ripping and it's tearing out there. And, and it's the same with tennis. You know, it's very quiet. 
except for a contact where it's still to the player, very quiet. Uh, yeah. and, and the racket face doesn't wobble. You know, right. if you hit a ball in a linear way uh, or with your arm, so to speak, the racket head will wobble. And it's not uh, a nice, it's not a nice hit in golf. They would call it a fat hit. Uh, um, but you know, a guy like Federer, it's what's so beautiful about him is when he hits in slow motion, the racket just stays calm at contact yeah. and, and very powerful at contact. Yeah. That's, that's, I think I mentioned this a little bit ago. That's, that's to me, that's relaxed tension and that's where it's at in, in, in all performance, whether it's tennis or playing drums or even playing guitar. Um, if you're relaxed and you're aware and you have full awareness, but you're not overly tense and tight, that's when you get the maximum control. And in the end, it's all about control and control is what wins the game. Yeah, I agree. In, con in control is, is big, you know, power is really emphasized in tennis, but for 99% of it, of us that play, it's, it's really more about control and consistency than it is about the power. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that people get all caught up, even, you know, in, in all the martial arts. And I, I competed as an amateur. And when you go in there and you just want to kill everybody, half the time you're going to get killed yourself because you are all spun up and you're wasting energy, too. Uh, you know, when you're in that zone, when you're in that infinity zone, you're flowing and it is effortless. And then, you know, you have you have the moment to moment responses from what comes back from your opponent. And you have to make those little adjustments. And of course, if you get caught up in your head and you're thinking about it, you're going to screw up, too, because you want to be natural. Um, you know, one of my first martial arts teachers used to say that the goal is to be able to be knocked out and still keep fighting because mm. your body knows what to do. So, mm. you know, trusting in the in the the wisdom of your body that's not conscious, that's really one of the keys to, to being effective. Uh, this might be the last question I ask you, but let's talk about consciousness. Uh, because for me, I, I played a set yesterday and I hadn't hit a ball in a few months just because I'm in Denver now. And this year it was a funny year and I just didn't get on the court for the last few months. And I played yesterday and guys said, let's play a set. Oh, okay. So I, it's funny. I didn't, I don't get nervous. I used to get a, really nervous when I played, uh, uh, you know, in my college career and high school and all that. And, and, and my arm would tighten up. And now uh, with, with my, you know, thoughts engrossed in the figure eight and the 45 degree angle and other things, uh, you know, more technical, but, but still based on, on, you know, that's basically what I do is lock into those thought mm -hmm. waves. Mm -hmm. And now I find that I, I, I am, and I used to want to be unconscious, right? All mm -hmm. tennis players, oh, I want to play unconscious. I don't want to think when I play. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, I am so focused now on, you know, lining up my shot and staying in the flow during the shot and moving with the speed of the ball and all the things we do uh, with the system that I just play now. I, mm -hmm. By being super conscious instead of unconscious, by being meticulously conscious, I actually find that I can get into the process more than the drama. And I played fine. I, played, I surprised myself. I played normal like I played yesterday, mm -hmm. you know, or the day before. I, it's like I've been playing all week. So uh, maybe you can comment on that idea of, of unconsciousness versus super consciousness. Well, so the, the, there are multiple levels. That's funny you should bring it up because I'm writing a book about that right now. I won't get into that. But um the idea of being aware and yet being relaxed and trusting that your body, your body is, people don't give their body credit for how brilliant it is. But when you think about it, your breathing, your heart rate, your body temperature, um, you know, if you get too hot, your body sweats. Uh, you, if you're exerting yourself, you're, you're going to breathe heavy because your body needs more oxygen. You don't think about all those things. You don't even think about walking, really. Unless you're like me and you're recovering from a bum knee, um, you're not conscious. You're just doing it. And, you know, uh, as an example, when I'm playing drums, I don't think about it. I let it flow. And, and to be honest with you, when I'm writing, there's a point where Stephen King always called it falling into the page. Where you kind of forget about what you're doing and you flow with it. 
And suddenly three hours gone by and you've got four really good pages and you're like, wow, where did that come from, right? But, but you have to be aware of the processes. So th there's also uh, a whole thing in, in shamanism, particularly with the work I do, of going from the heart to the head. So the, the heart is kind of, this is a generalization, but the heart is kind of the seat of emotions and the head is the intellect. If you're too caught up in the intellect, you're not gonna get anything done. If you're too emotional, you're gonna screw up and make bad moves anyway. So there again is sort of the figure eight between the two because you want to have a balance. You want to have some emotion with what you're doing. So, you know, uh, I, yeah, I want to win, but you're not all spun up about it. So there's that whole back and forth between those two um, elements within the body that bring that balance. So it has to do with being awareness. And, and one of the things about shamanism, uh, particularly when you get deeply into altered states, is you're learning to navigate. So if you're trusting in your body, you know what you're doing, you're not going to be freaking out about something your opponent may be doing. You're going to be aware of it and you want to come with a balance because the middle of the figure eight, the infinity zone is the point of balance. And this is all about balance. No matter where you are in the tennis stroke, where you are in the court, you want to be balanced in your, in your delivery and your reception back and forth. You want to be in that balance point. And when you're there, just like the eye of the storm, it's it's like I say, effortless mastery. You're you're flowing in that in that place of power, and you're in control. Yeah, I love it. Well, I agree. When you're in the center of the figure eight, uh, really at any point, but in the center is where all the control, power, and uh, you know the ease, the ease of stroke is. Um, Everything revolves well, around the center, right? So that's where you want to be, whether whether in your own body or with your opponent in the court. I guess that's there. why that's that's why you tell people to get centered. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I've been struggling my whole life toward it and it has to do with the expansion of consciousness because if you get caught up in your intellect or you get caught up in your emotions too much, you go you're going to make wrong decisions and you're going to screw up. But if you have the balance between the two and you react with an equal amount of of awareness of both of them, that's when you're going to be the most effective and have the most personal power. Um, well, I, I, as always, Matt, I, I, I love talking to you. We got to keep doing that and more of this stuff. Uh, it's just, to me, it's fascinating, all that stuff, because most people, 99.999% of the people don't live like you live, you know, uh, where they're really, <laughs> where they're really questing for something, you know, a deep meaning uh, yeah. and, uh, I do it on the court. I, I really do. I play left-handed, right-handed. I am always questing to do, uh, you know, what's deeper mm -hmm. in the sport. You know, more than just the score, so to speak, and just bragging rights. Yeah. We we try we try to get the most satisfaction out of our game uh, and, and loving, you know, enjoying the way we play. So I yeah. think that's a big deal. So I think that's what you talk about a lot is you know getting the most out of life and getting the most out of yourself and. And, you know, I don't know, being at one. Being at one and really seeking, striving for truth. Because truth is ultimately self-apparent. I mean, there's always subjectivity to truth, but in, in the bigger quote unquote cosmic picture, it's all about the greater truths. And the more you realize that there's so many forces that are way bigger than we are, that we're still just learning to comprehend and we learn how they all flow. Then we go with them and we become, you know, peak performers because we're we're going with the cosmic flow. I know it sounds like a cliche. It sounds like woo-woo. but um, right. No, it's <laughs> not. I mean, you see it in guys like Djokovic and Federer. You see it in Nadal. You, you see they're, they're so present. Their eyes get like silver dollars. Yeah, they're there. They're, they're showing up. Yeah, big time. Yeah. Well, Matt, I, I am so thankful. If you would you like to invite anyone to, to see some of your stuff, I'll, I'll absolutely put it on the show. Once I do this, you know, the writing for the show, the description, I'll put your links and all that. But Thank you. if there's anything you'd like to plug, please feel free. Well, my, my new book, as I say, is I like to call it the infinity zone on steroids. Okay. Um, holographic cosmic man. Um, the Holographic Heart of the Golden Mean is the subtitle. And if anybody just Google my name, when the first thing that comes up is my website, 
And I've got tons of other podcasts. This one will be up there. I'm on lots of different podcasts and radio shows and TV shows. Uh, and um, people hear me on one, then I get calls. Will you be on mine? I'm like, sure. You know, I, I think this is all important stuff. So people can find me if they go to my webpage. There's a contact form if they want to connect. I'm also on Amazon. My books are all ebooks, tree books, and audio books. Um, I'm still growing the audio books. There's maybe eight of them, 10 of them, something like that. No, 11 of them, I think, now that are audio books. I'm working on that. So great, I'm great, great, great. Well, I, I've seen them all. So I'll keep following you for sure. And we'll follow one another. And uh, exactly. folks, if you enjoyed this podcast like I did, please hit the subscribe button and the like button and go visit brodytennis.com. Love to see you. And you all have a great day, Matt. Thanks so much again for your time today. It was really, uh, really wonderful. And uh, it's all important, as you say. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Jack. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure to wrap with you, bro. Okay. All right. We'll talk soon. All right, my friend. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.